What's up everybody? This is Dan from The Greatest Story Ever Played. A few weeks ago, I uh, posted some stuff on Twitter asking what people's interest would be in additional content from the podcast, whether that be um, audio uploads, uh, additional audio uploads, blog posts, stuff on YouTube, you know, whatever, as it relates to video games, or I guess potentially even just other stuff. We kind of wondered if there was an interest in things that would be cool, that people would he- want to hear about, but wouldn't necessarily belong in our kind of main greatest story ever played feed. As we do want that to be pretty centrally, I don't know, in depth recaps of video games, uh, specific games, you know, episode by episode kind of deal. People seemed pretty interested in us, uh, yeah, adding some extra content. So uh, this is. Uh, one one shot at it and seeing how that goes so yeah i guess with that if you like this kind of thing let us know if you don't also let us know useful feedback but yeah we're gonna try this out and see how it goes for i guess our introductory additional material is a book that's about video games the book is called blood sweat and pixels the triumphant and turbulent stories behind how video games are made by jason schreiner So, the description for this book is Developing Video Games, Hero's Journey or Fool's Errand, Creative and Technical Logistics that go into building today's hottest games can be more harrowing and complex than the games themselves, often seeming like an endless maze or a bottomless abyss. I read this book recently, and I really enjoyed it, just getting this kind of behind-the-scenes look at how video games are made. It was pretty interesting getting a uh, background on how video games are made. At the beginning of this book, there's a quote where someone says, It's a miracle that this game got made. To which uh, the author replies, No, it's a miracle that any game gets made. Just after seeing what this process is like, it's a miracle any game gets made because it's uh, really a clusterfuck a lot of the time. Something that really sets video games apart is that there's not really a template, is what uh, Jason Schreiner puts forward. Each game is different, there's constantly changing tech and tools, engines people use, all of this stuff. And so really, each time you make a game, y- you do get some of your prior knowledge, use, um, but it's it's not like movies or something like that where, you know using film has been the main thing or you know you know different things like that video games because the technology is constantly evolving everyone's constantly learning new tech and learning how to use the tech the best it can to make the game and you, you know that kind of thing and and even that with video games uh, a lot of the stuff is happening simultaneous simultaneously like the art department is working on how the character should look, the writers are creating the story for the character, the level designers are setting that up, and uh, there were lots of times throughout the book where, you know, one one team would get something done, and then the other team would come and say, actually, we took that side story out, so we don't need that environment now. Work wasted. Gone. You know, uh, <laughs> that kind of thing was surprisingly common as the book went on and uh, it's just wild to see the chaos that video games are under just being a guy from afar who you know plays video games and makes a podcast about them versus being in the industry this sounds insane it was wild just hearing what this was like and the book is taken um from interviews that took place largely from 2015 to 2017 so what's cool about this is that the games that are covered they're Uh, you know, new, relevant, relatable. It's not like having to hear about Pong or something like that. This instead will be about the games that you've played or heard of, that kind of thing. So that's pretty cool. Um, And all the interviews are either on the record or there are some off the record. They're they're all from interviews that way. Jason Schreiner uh, also, you know, Bought, played, paid his way to do these interviews and stuff like that. He brings that up in the beginning of the book that he didn't accept you know, money from these people or anything like that to be able to, you know, give an objective look into this. So that that's kind of our, um, I guess, background on the book going into it. So the book itself is divided into 10 chapters. Each chapter covers the dev process of building said game, and it covers 10 different games. The games covered in the book are 
Pillars of Eternity, Uncharted 4, Stardew Valley, Diablo 3, Halo Wars, Dragon Age Inquisition, Shovel Knight, Destiny, Witcher 3, and Star Wars 1313. All the chapters uh, were very different, I would say, and you know how each game was made was very, very apparent how different they were, just like he uh, made the case for at the beginning of the book when you get to see it un uh, unveiled over these 10 chapters you very much see that going you know from triple a titles that are huge from big companies to very small ones and everything in between it was pretty fascinating just getting these behind the scene looks at how these games were made and if you haven't played even any of these games uh, their backgrounds could still be pretty interesting to you for me personally i'd actually only played uncharted 4 so far before hearing about the background of the other nine games, and I was interested in all of them, uh, despite how different they really all are. I don't, I don't know if that's helpful for you to hear or not, but I, I found that pretty noteworthy. And so what I wanted to do was kind of bring out some highlights. What I want to do is highlight five of the games and bring out some highlights within them. Uh, ultimately, I would love for you to read or listen to this book, because it's very worthwhile. So I don't want to go, uh, I guess, full spoiler on it, but what I do want to do is highlight five of the games and some interesting things about their development that stood out to me and is hopefully interesting to you as well. All right, so the first game is Stardew Valley. This game is a farming simulator type game, and it's made uh, by one guy named Eric Barone, and the Metacritic score for this game is 87. So thought of pretty positively and right made by one guy eric barone this is insane hearing about this he did everything on the game from uh the music to uh the art to the graphics to the programming the story all of it he did everything i cannot imagine doing this and as he talks about the game it's pretty wild he just doing everything so you know he'd be spending 10 16 hours a day just working on the game and that's what he did for almost four years yeah he worked on it from 2011 to 2016 uh is when it finally came out so five years even so he just was working ongoingly on this game and at the time he uh when he was working on the game he was living with his girlfriend who was in college at the time and then he worked part-time at a movie theater just to i don't know be around people and have something to do that wasn't on, wasn't working on the game but really he was just working on the game this was all he did it, it was just remarkable i mean i don't know the the talent level to hear about one dude making a game is outrageous to me like I, I can't even imagine it uh so super cool sounding it seems like a fun game and you know obviously was received pretty well getting an 87 on metacritic especially for a guy's first game by himself and it was cool hearing through it how his girlfriend was really supportive through the whole process and she was like no you know this is what he wants to do and so you know we'll both work on the side to be able to pay to Kind of live but will live tight and he's gonna make this game and that kind of thing it seemed cool it was like cool hearing that and and for him he uh said in the book that it was a pretty solitary life too and that he was just working alone on this game a lot and you know going through bouts of like i love this game i hate this game i tore a bunch of stuff out of the game because i think it sucks now and uh you know, have, having that whole thing. Uh, a thing that is detailed in other ones, other uh, chapters where they deal with teams, is you can bounce off each other how you're feeling about the game. You know, one person might say it's good, and one person might say it's bad. If you're feeling particularly negative, someone might be there to balance it out. For Eric Barone, it was just him. He was the only one working on the game, and so if he was feeling like it was shitty and shouldn't come out, he was really the only one working on it, so he didn't have anyone to go to. He did, of course, he, he talked to his girlfriend plenty about the game, and she, she offered her insight and stuff, and seemed very helpful, and very, very helpful and supportive. Um, she seems really awesome. But, you know, that's it, it, there is definitely a part of, like, I'm the only one working on this game. <laughs> Having a partner, probably even, uh, as a co-creator would have probably helped, I would think. So that, that, that seemed like a pretty unique challenge to his game. So 
That's the first one, Stardew Valley. Pretty interesting. Next game I wanted to talk about is called Pillars of Eternity. This is an RPG that's developed by Obsidian, and its Metacritic rating is 86. And when this game uh, started to be made, the studio was in a pretty tough spot. They had two games that they were working on for other companies, and then one of them gets canceled, and then the other one is looking a little shaky. Um, and so they're like, shit, are we going to have them both canceled? Are we going to have to lay a bunch of people off? That kind of thing. A couple of employees, though, went to kind of their upper management and were like, hey, we want to crowd crowdfund our next project via Kickstarter. We could do that. This will be a way to have our money already kind of in our hands that we know what we've got to work with rather than having an outside company like PlayStation or Microsoft or whatever who's paying us and could just, you know, cancel the game when they want to. Instead, we'll have that money in hand and we'll have fans who are supporting us and fans who we'll have to answer to and respond to, yeah, rather than these outside entities that could cancel us. Ultimately, the management agrees and are like, okay, fine, we'll do it. They weren't into it, but a couple of those couple employees who really spearheaded Pillars of Eternity were like, we will just leave and go do this ourselves if you don't want to do it with us, but we think that this is essential. Let's do a Kickstarter. Let's see what can happen. So they went into their Kickstarter thinking, you know, if we could get 800k, a million dollars, we could probably make a pretty good game and it could be like this. After their Kickstarter crowdfund raising time ended, they'd raised just under $4 million. So they killed it on their projections. But of course, as Kickstarters go, they had varying promises along the way. If we raise $2 million, we will add these features. If we reach $2.5 million, we'll add these features. If we reach $3 million, we'll add these features, and so on. What this caused is that they met tons of higher commitments, but they had a shitload of money to work on their game, far more than expected. You know, suddenly their game that they thought, okay, we could make in a year with this amount of money, wow, we've got a lot more money to deal with. We could, you know, have more of us do it. We could work on it longer. Also, we've got these additional things to do. That was kind of their uh, experience there. The higher commitments that they put onto their Kickstarter really added a lot of unforeseen consequences. One of the things that was highlighted in here was they promised if they raised a certain amount of money, they would make a second city. And that, you know, that would be a, a new feature kind of thing instead of just the one city the main story is in. And this created a lot of problems because they couldn't just make, you know, the original city bigger or just copy it and put it somewhere else. So they had to make a whole new city with whole new how it, how it looked and different things to do there and all of that. They couldn't, you know, just be like, oh, here's a little town, actually. This is what we meant. And, like, there's two quests there or something like that. They had to really do that. And... In uh, talking about it, they were like, yeah, we really fucked up. It would have been way easier to just make the new city twice as big or the original city twice as big or, you know, anything like that. Promising that second city really took them a long time to be able to create that and make it good and all of those things. So it was really interesting getting this perspective or side of it. What I really liked about this was the just the general Kickstarter thing. I thought that was super cool. I uh, I haven't particularly pledged on Kickstarter before. I think I did for a podcast conference once, but uh, you know that was about it. But I really liked the idea. It made me wish that I was a, a PC gamer because that's what this came out on originally. I think it might be on Xbox and PlayStation now, but I think it was a PC PC only at first, and I thought that was pretty cool. If I was a PC gamer, I think I would browse Kickstarters a little bit more because. I don't know, to get behind something like this. If it really lands, it would be cool to see something like this work out and be a part of and help support and that sort of stuff. So it was pretty cool. It was a, a cool look at development from the crowdfund perspective. All right, the third game I want to talk about is Uncharted 4. So this is an adventure game by Naughty Dog. Metacritic has it at a 93. This game, so different than the prior two, this is really a triple A, you know, huge title. It had a lot going on behind the scenes that 
was complicated. So Amy Henning, she was the previous writer and director from Uncharted uh, 1 through 3, the previous three games. And she worked on this game from 2011 to March 2014. So she'd spent several years working on this game with her team. Uh, this also was kind of the time period that The Last of Us was being built and coming out. So kind of two teams at Naughty Dog working in the Uncharted 4 team and then The Last of Us team. That's kind of going on. Ultimately, Amy Henning decides to leave the company. Uh, her and her vision for what Uncharted 4 would be and what Naughty Dog kind of wanted. It seems like they weren't kind of seeing eye to eye. They had also like a non-disparaging pact between Naughty Dog and her and her and Naughty Dog. So neither of them can really comment much on the situation. So they didn't. And there wasn't. She didn't interview for this book and Naughty Dog didn't even hit terribly hard on it. She leaves, and Naughty Dog comes to Neil Druckmann and Bruce Straley, who had just finished The Last of Us, and they're like, hey, so Amy's gone. You guys want to step in? And so they do. Neil and Bruce Straley, Neil and Bruce step in along with uh, their Last of Us team, and it's pretty wild. The Last of Us team had just launched The Last of Us, so they'd just gone through crunch time and, you know, all the chaos of that. They were thinking, okay, we'll get to simmer down for a little bit. Nope, we're all working on Uncharted 4. But to agree to do this, Neil Druckmann and Bruce Straley said, well, if you're, if you're really willing, the only way we're willing to do this is if you let us make the game our way. And they were like, yeah, we'll let you do that. And they're like, no, I mean, like, we're going to throw out almost all of the game. We don't want to finish her game. We want to make our own game. And Naughty Dog was like, sure, do it. That's exactly what Neil and Bruce and their team did. They threw out most of what was in Uncharted 4 originally. So several years of work, they tossed it out and were like, we want to make this our way to make it our own game, essentially. It's, it's pretty wild hearing some of the initial things that were going to be in there, like Sam. Sam Drake was actually a villain to start off in Amy Hennig's version of Uncharted 4. He was going to be bitter at Nathan, and that was uh, going to be kind of the way that would go. That You know, what we got is obviously far different. They recast several of the voice actors. Uh, the voice actor from for Sam was recast. So, the, you know, there was just tons of previous work gotten rid of. We got rid of the story. We got rid of voice actors. We got rid of locations you created or, you know, they used them less. Like, all of that. Um, so it's pretty wild. Like, these guys step in and they're like, yeah, we're going to get rid of a bunch of your work. But, yes, we will do it. And I guess more and uh, more or equally impressive is that it was still a good game. Metacritic giving it a 93. What a strong game. Especially one for such a turbulent background uh, is pretty wild. And I guess also as it relates to Uncharted 4, if you haven't listened to our podcast, we have episodes on all of the Uncharted games, or the first four, not Lost Legacy yet, and then also The Last of Us. So if you want to hear more of uh, our in-depth thoughts about those games specifically, go check them out there. All right, the fourth game I wanted to cover is The Witcher 3. So this is a RPG that's developed by CD Projekt, and its Metacritic score is 92. The background of this studio is super interesting. So they're in Poland, and back uh, before the guy who started this company started it, people in Poland, it was pretty common to go down to the market and you'd just buy bootleg games. People didn't, I guess they didn't have really copyright laws in Poland regarding video games, and so it was pretty normal to, you know, just go pick a game up. And that's what they do. These guys, though, um, started to decide to make their own distributing company, CD Projekt, and what they did first to make their money is they became the distributor for all these, you know, uh, Western games, U.S. games, and things like that, the distributor for Poland. And the way they did that was they would sell the game, but then they would add kind of things into it that would make it worthwhile. So like, oh, we'll, we'll add a Dungeon Master's Guide, or we'll add uh, these other things that you can't get if you just buy it from the bootleg. What they saw is that all these gamers would want to buy the non-bootlegged version if they were getting something in return. It really, really worked out. 
all of these companies started making them the distributor for Poland. This gave them enough money as a distributor to decide to become a game studio themselves. Once they became a studio, they started writing the Witcher series. So they had Witcher 1 and 2 come out. And at this point in time, European RPGs were kind of seen as second class. If you were into RPGs, it was you either liked kind of the bigger American titles or you liked the Japanese titles. And the European ones were kind of like, oh yeah, they're all right. So these guys wanted The Witcher 3 to change that. We're going to get European RPGs on the map more. We're going to get them respect they deserve because we're good devs and, you know, that kind of thing. And so their goal was to create 100 hours of story. We're going to make a big fucking game. And because of that, it, it, it's going to, this is going to be big. Also, we're going to work really hard to make this game look beautiful, have it be amazing, have it be an enormous game. And we're going to have it have great stories. And this is going to be huge. And because of this goal to make over 100 hours of story, they, of course, made way, 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 way more content than that they were talked about how the process of creating 100 hours of story was hard to know how long it would take because when they'd practice the quest they would do it in uh, what they called god mode which is you know one hit one kill so they would run doing the missions themselves but you know just with one hit one kill obviously if the mission is one hit one kill you can obviously progress through it far faster than you or i when we experience playing games <laughs> And once they kind of did that to see, okay, does the mission make sense? Is it easy to, you know, able to be done? Does it make sense? Whatever. They did that, but then, you know, once the difficulty has changed, all of a sudden uh, the length these things could take is very much increased. So they overshot and made an ass load of content for it. One thing also that I found pretty interesting in this is they had writers, but then they also had a department that was called the quest department. So they had different people whose jobs were specifically to make quests all around uh, their world, which I thought was super interesting. I feel like that would be a really cool job. You know, someone, I don't know, being the overarching writer for the game makes sense, but then it would be cool to be someone on the quest department where you're like, okay, cool, I'm gonna make these like five side quests that I think will be pretty cool or whatever. I thought that was interesting. I'm sure other companies have the same thing, but I, uh, I thought it sounded particularly interesting. Okay, the last game I wanted to cover is Star Wars 1313. This game was supposed to be an Uncharted style kind of Star Wars game from LucasArts. So LucasArts, of course, is uh, George Lucas's video game studio. And George Lucas, although not being a video game guy, was always interested in video games, so he'd pour his money there and solve it it could have value and could turn out cool. The game was originally set up to have an original Star Wars character kind of in the Star Wars universe and uh, do that. And so they'd written the story, it looked cool, it sounded great. Then, kind of last minute, George Lucas is like, hey, how about you make that character Boba Fett instead? Which I, as a person, would feel conflicted about. As a person, I think Boba Fett's pretty fucking cool, and I would definitely play a Boba Fett game. On the other hand, the video game, or the studio, had already created a whole backstory, a character, their abilities, all of that. So I would want to keep my original character. And because of this Boba Fett being dropped in by George Lucas, they had to rewrite a bunch of the game. Change the story, uh, they had to change the landscape, you know, because the fighting they had set up was for the abilities that uh, their character had rather than Boba Fett. Boba Fett, for instance, he has a jetpack. How does that um, come into play in this game? It really changed their game. It looked like they were at a spot where it um, could have been pretty sweet and then George Lucas made them change it. With this at the time, George Lucas, of course, was 100% owner of all of Star Wars. So he's the only guy that matters. He owns all of your company. So if George Lucas says, make it with Boba Fett, you, of course, are making it with Boba Fett. It's his company, his thing. Part of why they did an original character to start with was George Lucas at first was kind of apprehensive about giving them too much of the Star Wars universe, 
that kind of thing. But as he talked to them and liked more of it, he'd kind of be like, oh, yeah, you should add this city or you should add these characters or that kind of thing. So it, it seemed like a, an interesting work relationship. Then Disney bought Star Wars. Of course, this was huge, huge thing to have happen. And LucasArts, unfortunately, was caught in the middle. Disney came to them and said they were shutting the studio down because Disney has not had a lot of success making video games other than mobile games. So any Star Wars games that would get made, they want to kind of subcontract outside of the Disney brand. Sorry, LucasArts is no more. And boom, game went away. This was particularly wild because before Disney bought Star Wars as a franchise at E3, they had a gameplay, or not gameplay, a trailer for Star Wars 1313, and it fucking killed. Everyone was going wild. They were like, this game looks so cool. We want it right now. We want it, we want it, we want it. These guys thought that it might save them, but Disney still shut it down anyways. R.I.P. Star Wars 1313. This sounds exactly like the kind of game I would want to play. I like Uncharted quite a lot. I like Star Wars. I would have liked the original character. I would also like Boba Fett personally. Any of those things, gimme, gimme, gimme. Disney or anyone out there, if you want to make a Star Wars game like this, let me know. I want to play it. I'm interested. 100%. Yeah, so that is the uh, five I wanted to cover in there. Uh, the other five are very interesting as well and different from the five I covered. And the five I covered, there are more details than the ones I shared. They were uh, just the ones I wanted to highlight. So again, please go get this book. The audiobook is good. I thought the narrator did a very good job. I also uh, did pick up the physical book and look through it as well as I was kind of making notes for this to make sure I had different uh, stuff right and all that. So it's good. It's worthwhile. I don't know how much it cost. I picked mine up at the library, but either way, I highly suggest checking this book out. Really enjoyed it. Listener feedback. Blaze Knight on Twitter wrote in, and he said that he's played Diablo 3, Shovel Knight, and Dragon Age, and that Shovel Knight was his favorite of those three. So, cool. Good, good to know about that. Shovel Knight sounded super interesting reading about it. For me... Yeah, like I said, I've only played Uncharted 4 of these, so I definitely want to check out at least one of them, if not more. Because hearing about their backgrounds, their developments, uh, was super cool. And so I want to be uh, more a part of these games now. I guess if you have any other books on video games you like, or things you think would be cool to cover kind of in this additional content sphere, please let us know. You can uh, write into us at thegreateststoryeverplayed at gmail.com. Or on Twitter at StoryEverPod. And uh, yeah, we will see you next time. 